You ready to go? First guinea pig. A sustainable future is where a healthy environment, I'm sorry, that should be the first slide. A sustainable future is where a healthy environment and economic prosperity are common goals for the well-being of mankind. And Hendrick's genetics helps the world meet the demand for food by providing sustainable and in innovative uh, genetic solutions. Why? Because breeding is the single most powerful tool that impacts people, animal, planet, and profits. All the indicators suggest that the global population will increase to 9 billion people by 2050. And as Sir Bob Geldof said at Aquavision 2012, people aren't going to stop having sex in 2050. The number's going to keep on going. <laughs> and 98% of the world's food is generated on less than 30% of the planet. So that's a good advert for aquaculture in itself. And another much repeated fact is that by 2050, we need an estimated three planet Earths to feed the 9 billion people. Simple wake-up call. We won't have three planet Earths by 2050. The big question is, can we manage with just one? And the answer has to be yes. We just need to be more creative, more efficient, and less wasteful. So clearly, it's not enough just to recognize the importance of aquaculture, but we need to recognize the need for a sustainable industry in every respect. And breeding supports this in ensuring total chain efficiency. Animal health and welfare issues can be addressed alongside commercial traits. Breeding can focus on efficient use of inputs, minimization of chemicals, maximization of outputs. And that's overall sustainability. But where did it all begin? Well, first, Stone Age man was a hunter-gatherer, killing the end product when he needed to eat. And then he realized that keeping some cows and some sheep in his backyard was easier than roaming the plains and killing an animal to haul it home. And then he found that keeping males and females led to babies. So, for several thousand years, man domesticated animals to avoid the need to hunt. Interestingly, the number of species limited itself to just a handful, cattle, sheep, pigs, and poultry. And it's only in quite recent times that man realized that crossing the best male and the best female produced the best offspring, or could change the nature of the animal. And this idea really worked. Mass selection, based on particular traits, had a significant effect on production. People started trading good breeding stocks. The poultry industry has been revolutionized as yields have gone from a few eggs per cycle to now over 500 eggs per cycle. Milk yields have doubled in the last 40 years. Pigs have more piglets and bigger slaughter weights. But in aquaculture, where did it all start? Well, <coughs> 4,000 years ago, with the uh, capture of live wild fish in lagoons for continuous supply. Then the Chinese started carp farming about 2,500 years ago. Hatcheries started 400 years ago, and in the last 100 years, we've seen the sophistication of farming systems in select species, up to the modern high-tech systems in salmon that we see today. And there are hundreds of species that are farmed at significant levels, but the real commercial shortlist is limited to just a handful, both freshwater and marine. High-level, high-tech production and breeding is largely limited to salmonids, tilapia, shrimps, and some marine whitefish species. And this is driven by volume and value, and that, that list isn't likely to increase in the future. But significant breeding in aquaculture started with a simple mass selection some 40 years ago. A number of global programs were set up, mainly in salmon, where best males were crossed with best females. Best meant biggest, or biggest survivors, and farmers could create their own seed stock. However, single trait selection, little control of inbreeding, wasn't the future. So we move into the realms of quantitative genetics. This is the study that the effects that heredity and environment have on particular traits. And we predict an individual's performance based on how their parents or their siblings did. It allowed for the first time a focus on multiple trait selection and the concept of balanced breeding, where welfare and health issues can be addressed at the same time. And in the last 10 years, the scientists have zoomed into genome level. Performance prediction isn't based on how relatives performed, but on SNP markers known to be associated with desirable or undesirable traits. It's more accurate. It allows selection for less easily measurable traits, such as those that can't be measured on live animals. It also targets individuals rather than families. And we're just scratching the surface of available data. More data available is both an opportunity and a challenge. How to deal with the increase in volume, the rate at which it's collected, the number of data points, often from multiple sources and multiple formats. But in simple terms, more data per individual means better selections. So from here, where can we go? Well, to quote an American politician, there are no knowns out there, new technologies that are developing and can be used in, in commercial animal breeding, such as GMO and CRISPR. In simple terms, turning bad genes into good genes. CRISPR's already there with a cure for leukemia or taking malaria away from mosquitoes. We might be some way from public acceptance in food, but it's coming, believe me. And then there are the known unknowns. While we're still thinking about these technologies, 
They're already developing far into the future, like Minicas 9 and Ungargo. Please, don't ask me to explain those. Technology and scientific knowledge is developing far faster than we can keep up, so for a non-geneticist like me, this slide is the longest 20 seconds of my life. <laughs> and then we have the unknown unknowns. Just how far could we take this technology? Technology that's developing so fast, could we create the perfect organism? Should we even go there? How would that look? No antibiotics or chemicals or environmental impact. Maximum efficiency. Is that utopia or reality? It raises a whole load of ethical arguments, but we should look at what we can do today. Firstly, why do we want genetic solutions? Well, the answer is because performance is the sum of genetics and environment, P equals G plus E. Breeding leads to more efficient production, like better survival, lower FCR. Thus, we need breeding to produce more with less. And if we put less in to get more out, we boost profits of the value chain. Secondly, how can genetic solutions help? The answer, less is more. If we need less input to create more output, we conserve resources and we stretch the capability of our planet, our one planet, not three. And they're both um, core definitions of sustainability. And thirdly, what is the outcome of improved genetics? Well, the answer, more is more. Balancing commercially valuable traits such as survival and growth with welfare traits, traits is the key to efficiency and sustainability. More efficient and sustainable protein production will help feed the world, not just today, but in the future too. And we owe that to the extra two billion people and be on this planet over the next 20 or 30 years. So, to close off, Better Breeding Today focuses on solving challenges with the technologies we use today. Brighter life tomorrow means advances in innovation, collaboration, sustainability, and the value we bring to the animal protein value chain. At Hendrix Genetics, we believe that breeding offers the only truly sustainable solution to the challenge of feeding an increasing population from a finite resource. Thank you for listening.